All right, guys. So at this point, I got to say, this this is where it got tough for me. Okay, this was so boring. Um, but and I mean, I think one of the reasons why is because there's this is the point at which there's not a lot of underlying concepts that you need to understand. It's more just going through the stuff. Okay, but anyway, I'm not going to explain everything because there's not that much to explain. But what I will do is just kind of just guide you through the stuff so that it's it's all in context. It's making sense. Okay, so remember how we got here. We're looking now at the methods of conservation, basically, and the the way we got here was first we looked at what factors were affecting. Um, biodiversity, i.e. what factors were causing the biodiversity levels to go down. Mainly it was based on human activity and factors relating to that. Next we looked at why biodiversity was important to maintain. So what are the benefits of biodiversity essentially? And <clears throat> in this last section it's about what are the me methods of conservation. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm wary, I don't want to end up just reading the textbook out to you. So I will go through it, highlighting important bits. And um, if there's anything that crops up where I think explanation is necessary, I will do that. Okay, so there's basically, there's three aspects to this conservation. Okay, so let's just quickly look at that. So conservation is going to have three important aspects. So there's first there's in situ conservation. So that's conservation that's taking place in the habitat, in the natural habitat of the organism. Conservation that's ex situ. And that's that means taking the organism out of its habitat and carrying out the conservation activities away from that normal natural habitat. Okay, we're talking about zoos and wildlife parks. And finally, it's the last thing is about international international cooperation and even including uh, w even at the national level within within the country kind of local um, local legislation, so local laws that promote allow conservation. Okay, so th these are the three main branches. We'll begin with conservation, conservation in situ. And essentially, the first part is defining what it is, what it's trying to achieve. Okay, and I would point you to the kind of two main ways that in situ con conservation is trying to um, achieve. Okay. Um, we've already discussed what in situ conservation is. It's the process of conservation of the species in their natural habitat. How is that happening? A, you're trying to limit the impact of human development. Presumably it's the human development that is causing the species to be endangered. Okay, and you're trying to maintain the habitat's natural features. Possibly it's these features that are being lost and that's why the um, organism's population is going down. We've discussed those concepts already. Okay, so how do you do that? First, legislation, you've got to pass some laws and through enforcing of the laws, you hope that these will be achieved, okay? The other thing is wildlife reserve. So the habitat, you, you change the status of that area to a protected wildlife reserve where you can try to preserve those habitats, natural features, and hope that that is going to make the population sizes of the organisms uh, become more healthy. Okay, so a uh, bit of discussion about what the laws are trying to achieve. Um, if you have access to my PowerPoint, this is a gif of a cat falling asleep. It is quite funny. Um, 
Hopefully, ironically, that will keep you awake. Next, wildlife reserves, um, how they work, what they are, okay, the, you know, the, the, the basis on which, uh, you know, one decides whether an area is good to be a wildlife reserve or not. I've tried to make a bit more sense of this than there is in the textbook. Um, and f uh, moving on from that, how the conservation in situ can conflict with, you know, the human populations that might be in that area. Remember that we've, you know, we mentioned before that, you know, th there's some parts of the world where human development is still in pro it's still, still in its kind of in process, okay? Now, it's all well and good to say, well, we shouldn't affect biodiversity, biodiversity is important. But on the other side of that coin is this idea that human populations, you can't restrict, you know, you can't prevent the development of a, of a, of a country, of, of any people, um, simply based on the idea of biodiversity. That's also wrong. So this conservation, you know, conservation, uh, the idea is that the reason why conservation was even needed was because humans must have been impacting on an area. Okay. So when, when you then place in measures to carry out conservation, essentially you are trying to reduce the human impact. Now, it might be that you know that you know humans don't go around just reducing biodiversity because it's a hobby they are they are they they're inadvertently causing a reduction in biodiversity because there is some interest for the human in that thing so whenever you place conservation measures in in situ it's likely that you're going to run into some conflict with the indigenous uh, people of that area okay so you know, that has to be negotiated. So a few reasons about why that conflict can arise is mentioned. And then there's some examples of wildlife reserves in the UK. And finally, we finish with this idea of repopulation. And this is important because the idea is that you have a habitat that the biodiversity went down because of human impact, but then by placing the conservation measures in situ, hopefully what you're gonna do is result in a repopulation and, and restore that habitat, that ecosystem to maybe something that resembled more what it was before the human impact became so uh, significant. And that's the ultimate aim of maybe all conservation measures. Okay, then we discuss conservation ex situ. Okay, so next we have conservation ex situ, which means you're taking organisms out of their normal natural habitat and whatever activities you are doing for conservation is not occurring within the natural habitat, it's occurring elsewhere. Okay, I guess it might make sense to discuss why you would want to do this. So um, remember that, you know, in an ideal world, you conservation is being done in situ to, to restore that ecosystem back, you know, to to, to what it was before the human impact. However, in some cases it might be that, you know, the impact of humans or whatever the change that is happening to cause the, the biodiversity of a species or an area to decrease, whatever's causing that is still having an impact in that area. Maybe you can't uh, convert that place into a wildlife reserve. In that case, if, if the impact is going to continue, the best thing might be to, to try and you know, take some individuals of, of that population, that species out of the area, 
or increase the numbers of that population outside from that place because it, it, it might be that if that if those organisms continue to stay in that place their numbers will continue to get lower and lower and that wouldn't be a good for conservation so if if the habitat still poses a threat to the species essentially they then conservation it might have a better effect ex situ than in situ so the general structure of kind of this section is essentially two parts conservation of animals and conservation of plants okay in terms of animals the ex situ conservation method is zoos or wildlife parks okay and in terms of plants you have botanic gardens essentially they're like a zoo type equivalent where the plants are grown you have visitors and um, the visitors who come to see the plants essentially fund whatever conservation uh, efforts are needed in terms of plants okay um, but in terms of plants you also have seed banks and that that's a kind of slightly different uh, situation um, but in each case um, what I saw is that you need to know what the general aim of that conservation uh, method is as well as any advantages and disadvantages that uh, arise because of each of those methods because you know n nothing is ideal so you have the purpose of zoos um, essentially um, and we'll we'll discuss this a bit further while the zoos originated as as more of a uh, an, an, an entertainment or some kind of attraction to to get crowds of people to kind of see things that they haven't seen before nowadays i guess the the focus is shifting more on conservation and using zoos or wildlife parks as they like to be called using them to do the research that is needed in order to increase the population sizes of of endangered species okay and, and to raise awareness of you know, we don't see it because of our lifestyles and and where we are but you know biodiversity is being impact impacted all over the planet and sometimes the only time that we are reminded of that is you know when we do visit uh, a wildlife park okay the idea is uh, you know purpose of zoos essentially is to maintain the population of populations of some endangered species in order to do that they they have captive breeding programs so they try to encourage these organisms to to reproduce um, ex situ and thereby increasing the numbers okay but in order to do that they have to research the habitats mating behavior and reproductive physiology of the species so this these two concepts are very important this idea of captive breeding programs and this idea that in order to have a successful captive breeding program you need to do research on the organisms on their natural habitats in order to try and replicate or simulate those conditions to have a successful um, a captive breeding program where offspring is produced and the population size is increasing so this is one example where you had um, I think Colchester Zoo they had some flamingos and uh, they based on the research it was found that flamingos are more likely to reproduce in an environment where you know there's large numbers of flamingos because that's what happens in their natural environment and so in order to simulate that well they couldn't they don't have the numbers to do that in the zoo but in order to create the effect of large numbers of flamingos they deployed these mirrors and apparently uh, with some uh, success okay so this is the kind of thing that's uh, going on okay now zoos also have to have the genetic information of each of the individual this is to ensure that as these uh, individuals breed or, and reproduce that they are doing so in a way that maintains the genetic variation of the species so for example you're 
you're making sure that if you have an individual AA that that you are not um, allowing this individual to uh, reproduce with an individual that is also AA a, or little a little a because that's just going to give you little a little a offspring and it's not um, doing anything for the genetic variation in an already small population so if you have the genetic information of these individuals and you know that somewhere else there's an individual that is that you know it makes sense to make more hetero zygotes because that that then keeps the genetic variation high uh, prevents kind of loss of alleles and so on okay so we talked about the genetic erosion in order to prevent genetic erosion if you do ha if you do know the, the the lineage of your organisms okay then you can choose individuals that are kind of more distantly uh, related or not related at all and in that case when they reproduce there's much more uh, it's much more likely that you know and uh, we're generating new combinations of alleles and, and genetic variation is being maintained rather than if you choose if you allow individuals that are ultimately kind of related that's going to lead to a lot of reduction in variation and more homozygosity okay and inbreeding essentially okay right other techniques so that was captive breeding is kind of using natural uh, reproductive processes and behaviors but other techniques that are also at the disposal of of these facilities is artificial insemination in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer okay and then we go through the advantages and the disadvantages i'm not going to specifically go through any of this okay and then we look at botanic gardens their advantages and the disadvantages of botanic gardens and what seed banks do essentially seed banks a similar idea really to you know to maintain this genetic diversity this genetic variation because and and it's mainly seed banks is mainly with with the uh, with the with the purpose of ensuring that agriculture can continue indefinitely for to serve the human population okay um, at, at some point somebody realized that you know if if um, if agriculture continues to carry out selective uh, breeding uh, and you know selectively choosing you know one kind of variation in a from a population what's going to happen is the genetic diversity is going to get so low that given climate change is happening and given that the conditions are likely to be different in the future we might not have the genetic variations that are capable of tolerating the conditions of the future and so somebody decided at some point it might be a good idea to go out into the natural uh, environments collect seeds from different places collect seeds of the same species of very different varieties for each species okay and then kind of just storing them in a way that um, allows the seeds to remain viable for as long as possible okay and this is the idea of seed banks okay <coughs> so we talk about the idea or the general aim of seed banks okay and finally then we will discuss the protection of species and habitats the international agreements collaborations and UK schemes to maintain biodiversity <laughs>